Hello, everyone. So we're going to get started in a minute or so. Um, there are almost 500 of you guys registered today, so thank you for joining us. This briefing is going to be on Governor Newsom's proposed 2019-20 state budget. This is Janice Yee, the Development Manager at the California Budget and Policy Center. This program today is brought to you through our Policy Perspective Speaker Series. This is a series of free, free webinars and in-person events held throughout the year and throughout the state. The Policy Perspective Series is brought to you by our generous support of our funders, First 5 LA and the Stepsky Foundation. All right. So today we're is going to go a little bit like this. The Budget Center team will be giving a brief overview and context on the various parts of the proposed budget based on our first look analysis that we had released earlier this week. Overall, we will be covering economic and revenue conditions, economic security, children and families, education, health, and a few more other areas. As we go through each section, you will have, if you have any quick or clarifying questions, feel free to either message us in the group through the chat function on your webinar at the bottom of your sort of um, key screen, or you can tweet us by using hashtag policy perspectives. We will try to address those questions during each section. However, if you have longer or more complex questions, we will be holding those for the Q&A portion of the webinar, which will happen after all the analysts give their brief overviews. So with that, um, thank you all again for joining us, and I will turn you over to Budget Center Policy Analyst Kayla Kitson. Kayla, go ahead and take it away. Okay, hi everyone. Um, to start off, the budget proposal assumes continued economic and revenue growth in the near term. The budget projects that the general fund, general fund revenues over the three-year budget window, which spans fiscal years 1718 to 1920, will be about $8 billion higher than what was estimated in the last budget agreement. Um, of course, there are risks to the, to the economic outlook, like the fluctuating stock market, which could impact future revenues. But given that the fiscal situation is expected to um, still be in good shape for the upcoming fiscal year, the governor is proposing to build up reserves and pay down debt. Proposition 2, which was approved by voters in 2014, requires a specified portion of general fund revenues to be set aside each year, with half going into the rainy day fund and the other half being used to pay down budgetary debt. So Prop 2 also specifies that once the rainy day fund reaches 10% of general fund tax revenues, any revenues that would have been required to go into the account have to be diverted to infrastructure spending. Uh, in past years, Governor Brown made some supplemental transfers to the reserve on top of what is constitutionally required by Prop 2. Um, so the rainy day fund has actually now reached its maximum. However, the governor's budget assumes that the, those supplemental payments uh, by Governor Brown don't count towards the 10% maximum. So the budget includes a $1.8 billion transfer to the rainy day fund instead of diverting any additional revenues to infrastructure. The proposal also includes a $700 million transfer to the safety net reserve that was created in last year's, um, last June's budget agreement, which can support CalWORKs and Medi-Cal benefits during a future recession. <clears throat> the uh, $1.8 billion that's required by Prop 2 to pay down debts would be used to reduce unfunded liabilities in the state's retirement programs, that's CalSTRS and CalPERS, uh, and of that $1.8 billion, $1.1 would be used for a supplemental payment to CalSTRS above what's, uh, what's required by law annually, and the budget also proposes a $3 billion supplemental payment to CalPERS. And finally, the proposal includes a $4 billion to um, completely pay off budgetary debts that were incurred during the Great Recession and to reverse some payment deferrals made in, in past decades. And with that, I will hand it over to uh, analyst Alyssa Anderson. Okay, thanks, Kayla. Uh, and so just as a reminder, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, or you could tweet us at hashtag policy perspectives. So I'm gonna talk about the governor's Cali ITC proposal. Uh, so in the governor's budget, he's proposing to significantly expand the Cali ITC. Um, this is a refundable state tax credit that basically helps low earning workers and their families better make ends meet. Um, and the governor's proposal would do two main things. First, it would extend the credit to workers a little bit higher up the income scale, uh, people making up to about uh, $30,000 a year. 
Um, currently, families have to make under about $25,000 a year to qualify for the credit. Um, and the administration estimates that by extending the income limit a little bit higher, um, that about 400,000 tax filers, as well as their spouses and dependents, would become eligible for the credit. The second major thing that the governor's proposal uh, would do is increase the size of the Cal EITC, specifically for workers with incomes at the higher end of the eligibility range. Um, these are people who currently receive relatively small credits, um, and they still have very low incomes, even though they're at the higher end of the eligibility range. Um, we're talking about folks making you know, somewhere from like $14,000 to $30,000 a year. Um, the third major thing that the uh, governor is proposing is to provide an additional $500 per child uh, under age six to families who qualify for the Cali ITC. Um, now, there's been some confusion about whether this is actually per five, actually $500 per young child or per family with young children. Um, the LAO was told that this proposal was per child, uh, but I want to note that the trailer bill language is not out yet, and so we'll have to wait for that um, to confirm whether it's really the administration's intention to provide this per child. Um, if it is, it would provide a very significant increase in the Cali ITC for families with young children. Um, in addition to expanding the credit, the administration is proposing to explore how the state could provide workers um, with their Cali ITC in monthly payments as opposed to an annual lump sum. Um, and the idea here is that a monthly payment would line up better with the monthly expenses that workers face. Um, we would argue that this should actually be optional because some workers um, really might need that refund right away. Um, also, this wasn't initially in our budget summary, um, but we just added it yesterday and we got confirmation that the governor's proposal um, includes some funds for outreach. Specifically, the governor is proposing to provide $5 million as matching funds to community-based organizations and other entities um, to, that increase awareness of the Cali ATC and of free tax prep services. Um, and that's important because the majority of people who qualify for the Cali ATC pay to file their taxes. And so that means they don't get the, the, the full benefit of the credit. Um, finally, the governor is proposing to rename the Cali ITC the Working Families Tax Credit. Um, and we've been getting some questions about whether this name only applies to the $500 provided to young children. Um, the proposal is actually to rename the entire credit, the Cali ITC, the Working Families Tax Credit. Um, the administration estimates that if this expansion is approved, it would reduce state personal income tax revenues by about a billion dollars. And to offset this revenue loss, the administration proposes that California conform to several federal tax law changes from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Um, and they expect that these changes would generate a billion dollars. Um, one thing to note is that this will require a two-thirds vote of the legislature since it will raise revenues. Um, and I want to point out that this aspect of the governor's proposal um, is still pretty vague. Um, the proposed budget just basically lists some potential areas where the state could conform to federal law without any detail. Um, and it says that these changes will mainly impact business income. So this will be something to watch. Um, I'm sure we'll be writing more uh, about this as details emerge. Um, and just briefly, if you're wondering what conforming to federal law means, um, basically California has the ability to choose which provisions of federal tax law to conform to. And when California conforms to federal tax law, it basically means the state adopts those provisions as part of the state's tax code. Um, so now I will turn it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about the governor's proposals for housing and for addressing homelessness. Sorry, Alyssa, before we switch it over to Sarah, um, there is a question. Okay. What is the total rainy day fund reserve currently? Oh, maybe that's to... Um, that might be for Kayla. Kayla. Yeah. Hi, sorry, it took me a while to get set up. <laughs> Um, the, at the end of last year, I believe the fund was about $13.5 billion, and at the end of the year, they expect it to be $15.3 billion. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but that should be in the first look analysis. Thanks. Thanks, Kayla. Can we go ahead, um, Sarah? Okay. 
Sarah, I think we're having a little trouble with your sound. Can you? Um... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we <laughs> go. <laughs> I'll be talking about um, the governor's proposals related to housing affordability as well as homelessness. Um, and I want to start by saying it's just really refreshing to see such a strong focus on uh, the housing affordability crisis that is faced by California um, in this January budget proposal by the governor um, and in, in several proposals related to a state level role in addressing the housing affordability crisis. This is something um, that we did not see uh, as much with uh, Governor Brown. So this is a, 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 new, uh, a new attitude towards housing uh, we seem to be seeing in this January budget. Um, so the governor's budget proposal um, includes quite a bit of one-time funding, um, some ongoing funding, and some regulatory changes that are all intended to help address California's housing affordability problems that we have. Um, so for there is some significant one-time funding linked to housing production goals, so linked to um, ensuring that the state is producing the number of housing units that we uh, need to produce in order to uh, make sure that there is a place for that is affordable um, for all Californians to, uh, to live in and for those who um, throughout the state. Um, so the one-time funding includes $250 million for planning for local jurisdictions planning to meet housing production goals as well as $500 million in um, incentive funding uh, for jurisdictions that are show that they're meeting their progress towards uh, achieving their housing production goals. Um, and those that, that $750 million total um, in one-time funding is linked to um, a proposal to revamp the process that the state uses to allocate um, housing production goals to different regions and local jurisdictions, the regional housing needs allocation process uh, or arena process. Um, there were some um, significant reforms to that process uh, adopted by the legislature last year. Um, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see how those reforms interact with the proposal that the governor is putting forward here. Um, the governor also mentions uh, the consideration of linking transportation funding for local jurisdictions to um, meeting housing production goals. Um, there are not uh, specific details on exactly how that would work, but that's uh, definitely something that uh, that is in there and would be something to to watch uh, as the budget uh, season moves forward. Um, in addition to uh, th that funding related to housing production goals, there's also some uh, one-time funding that's specifically for development of new housing. Um, Five hundred million dollars allocated uh, proposed for production of um, moderate income housing, and that would be um, distributed through the Mixed Income Loan Fund at the California Housing Finance Agency. Um, and um, this reflects a, an interest in um, workforce housing or housing for moderate income households that we see throughout the, the governor's uh, proposal. Um, uh, so that's the one-time funding that's in the proposal. There's also a significant proposal for um, on, on, on an ongoing basis, expanding the funds that are um, available to support housing uh, production um, by expanding the, the state's housing tax credit program, the state's low income housing tax credit program or LIH uh, TC LIHTC program. Um, so there's a proposal to um, increase the, the LIHTC program by up to $500 million on an ongoing basis. Um, and um, increasing that, that uh, program has been an, a, a priority for housing advocates, so um, it's, it's interesting to see that in here. Um, and the way the uh, governor proposes to allocate that funding specifically, or that, sorry, that tax authority specifically is, um, tax credit authority specifically is 300 million for the current uh, LIHTC program, um, paired with the federal credit that is currently underutilized, um, along with $200 million for a new program, um, which is described as um, a targeting development of housing for households that make 60 to 80 percent of area median income, so more moderate income households. This would be uh, a new program uh, that is does not currently exist within the state's LIHTC program. Um, um, in addition to the funding, there's also some regulatory changes that the that are included in the budget proposal. Um, one is to allow um, to utilize excess state property um, for the development of housing. Um, so the idea would be that uh, property that state uh, owns that is appropriate for housing could be used um, as uh, to develop affordable housing. 
Um, a second is a second proposal is to um, encourage um, uh, housing development by incentivizing the use of some economic development tools, um, specifically the um, enhanced infrastructure financing districts that were um, created um, through a state law um, after redevelopment agencies were dissolved back in uh, 2011 and 20, 2012. Um, and so these EIFDs um, are a tool that local jurisdictions can use to, um, to finance infrastructure, including affordable housing, although not just limited to affordable housing. Um, and the proposal um, proposes making those districts more appealing um, by removing the, uh, making it easier for them to issue bonds to fund projects by removing a 55% voter requirement to issue bonds. Um, and in addition, uh, the, the budget proposal proposes uh, aligning these EIFDs with uh, the federally the federal opportunity zones program um, right, without a lot of specific details on how that would happen, but um, the, the general idea would be to um, support uh, investment in affordable housing in opportunity zones um, by, um, by conforming with federal law in that aspect and also by pairing uh, EIFDs with opportunity, opportunity zones. Um, so those are the proposals related to housing. Um, separate from that, the issue of, of uh, permanent housing, um, there are also a significant part of the government's budget proposal is dedicated to the, to the issue of homelessness. Um, and it is important to notice, note that homelessness is a, is a major problem in California um, the state has 25% of the national homeless population and about two thirds of the, those homeless individuals in our state are unsheltered. So living on the street or in a park or in a vehicle and those kinds of um, places. Um, and the governor's proposal very strongly focuses on that unsheltered homeless population, um, especially those in that population that have significant health or mental health or behavioral health needs. Um, so there's a combination of both funding uh, and regulatory changes proposed um, in terms of a state role to help address the, the homelessness crisis. So um, $500 million is proposed um, to increase the statewide capacity for um, emergency shelters and homeless navigation centers. Um, so this would be distributed in um, with $300 million for the that would be directly for development of emergency shelters and navigation centers, but would only be available to local jurisdictions that were participating in a regional planning effort to address homelessness. Um, and then there would be an additional $200 million available as kind of incentive funding um, for um, local jurisdictions that can show that they are making concrete progress towards the development of um, uh, shelters or navigation centers or permanent supportive housing that would support um, individuals who are homeless. Um, in addition, there are some specific proposals uh, related to helping individuals who are homeless address their um, health and mental health needs and increase their economic um, their uh, economic well-being. So there's $100 million proposed for the whole person care pilot programs. These are um, programs that um, are administered through the, uh, sorry, this is a program that's administered through the Department of, um, through the Department of, um, uh, sorry, through the Department of Healthcare Services, um, and it provides coordinated health and behavioral health and supportive services together with housing services to meet the needs of individuals who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Often, are the individuals targeted by these programs and try to address their needs in a holistic way, um, including through um, ensuring that they are housed. Um, and then, in addition, there's a proposal to um, provide $25 million for the Housing and Disability Advocacy Program, and this is a program that helps homeless individuals apply for disability benefits, um, since among those who are um, have physical or mental disabilities, um, so that they can link them up to um, federal uh, benefits that will help them meet their needs. Um, besides those funding proposals in the homelessness area, I will finish here by um, talking about the, some of the regulatory changes that are proposed. Um, the governor proposes um, making it easier for local jurisdictions to develop new um, homeless shelters and navigation centers by streamlining the environmental review process uh, for those types of projects. Um, and also proposes um, developing a statewide policy to um, increase the land available for um, development of shelters by allowing 
um, emergency shelters to be developed on state land that is uh, it is located within the Department of Transportation um, right of way, but highway right of way limits, but used for non transportation purposes. This is called the Caltrans airspace. Um, and so this proposal would expand on a policy from last year that allowed for emergency shelters to be sited on this type of land in a few locations in California, it would expand it more broadly. Um, so um, that's the summary of the housing and homelessness proposals included in the in the budget. And I, now I will hand it over to Essie to talk about Actually, the works program. Sorry, Thera, um, we do have a question for you. Um, where do the funds for the expansion of the tax credits from the low income housing come from, i.e. the general fund or something else? Um, well, it's... Uh, so it, it's because it's a housing tax credit, uh, it's it actually what it does is it reduces uh, state uh, it it's, uh, reduces state uh, revenues. It's it's a it's in a sorry it's a it uh, so it's uh, it would reduce general fund revenues essentially is how it works as as um, as, as opposed to having a specific designated uh, revenue source outside of that. Okay, thank you. Um, and you might not answer this, but maybe Scott might, but it, somebody had asked, is there any funds allocated for senior housing? There's, uh, there's not funding specifically allocated for single, for senior housing, um, but the, um, the, so none of the funds that are allocated for housing development or to encourage housing, um, production are specifically linked to housing for seniors, but certainly seniors might be among those who would be eligible to live in the low income or moderate income housing that is is proposed to be supported. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. And then we can go ahead and Essie, can you take over? <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, as a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions for us, go ahead and enter those into the chat box, or you can also tweet at us, um, but please make sure that you remember to use the hashtag policy perspective so that we can keep track of those questions on Twitter. So I'll start our discussion of the proposed investments in children and families uh, with a discussion of the proposal around CalWORKs grants. So as you may know, uh, and as we've already covered in prior reports, Currently, uh, the annualized maximum aid payment for a family of three with no other income in the CalWORKs program leaves them living well below the deep poverty threshold, which is defined as 50% of the federal poverty line, and it has done so for 11 years. Now, this is concerning because, as we know and as the research shows, living in poverty for any period of time is detrimental for children, but deep poverty in particular lowers chances that a child will succeed at throughout all stages of the life course. So we were rather encouraged um, when in the 2018-19 uh, budget package, we saw the proposal to raise the maximum grant uh, to the deep poverty threshold, albeit over three years, starting with uh, a 10% increase um, effective April for, this April 1st, 2019. Now in his budget proposal, Governor Newsom proposes an additional 13% 13 13.1% uh, 13 increase to the grant, which would be effective October 1st, 2019. So this would bring the maximum grant directly to 50% of the federal poverty line, um, obviously much sooner than the earlier proposal of, of three years. And to do so, he allocates 347 or proposes allocating $347 million uh, general fund for the 2019 uh, fiscal year with a full year cost of $455 million. The proposed budget also expands investments in infant and maternal well being, particularly via home visiting services. So, as you may recall, the 2018 19 budget package instituted a new home visiting initiative in the CalWORKs program. Now, initially, this program was proposed as a pilot. Uh, it's now permanent and ongoing and very much here to stay. Um, it started January 1st, um, and it provides up to 24 months of home visiting services for CalWORKs parents 
who uh, are parenting a uh, pregnant or parenting a child under the age of two. In uh, that last budget package, uh, there was a set aside of a mix of, of $158 million uh, through a mix of federal TANF and state general funds dollars, which would support the program for three years, after which it would be subject to annual appropriation. So Governor Newsom proposes taking about $79 million of that 158, um, specifically for 2019-20 to support those home visiting services. Uh, we also wanna call attention uh, to his proposal for $23 million uh, general fund to expand home visiting outside of the CalWORKs program. So currently there are home visiting pro um, programs administered through the Department of Public Health, um, but the Department of Public Health receives federal funds to administer these programs, not state funds. So this would actually uh, represent the first such state uh, financial investment in home visiting for non-CalWORKs CalWORKs parents. So we're uh, interested uh, in seeing how that um, develops. The governor also proposes uh, an investment of seven and a half million dollars to increase participation in the Black Infant Health Program. Uh, this program is also administered through the Department of Public Health, uh, and its goal is to increase um, health for African-American mothers uh, and their infants, uh, and to also reduce um, existing racial disparities in health uh, that we see in our state. And then finally, uh, really quickly, before I hand things off to my colleague, Kristen Schumacher, I wanna briefly mention uh, the proposal around child savings accounts. Um, we do explore this um, more in our report, so please go ahead and read that uh, if you haven't already. Um, but the governor proposes a one-time investment of $50 uh, million general fund for pilot projects to increase access to uh, child savings accounts. Now, child savings accounts um, are asset building accounts for children. Um, in this proposal, um, it would be for specifically for incoming kindergartners. The proposal right now is still rather vague and hasn't been fleshed out, so we will be keeping our eye on that. Um, please do look out for uh, likely further um, reports from us on that proposal. Um, but that sort of ends my my section. Um, if there are, unless there are questions, um, Janice, I'm now ready to hand it over to Kristen. Take it away, Kristen. Hello, right. everyone. <laughs> Kristen Schumacher here. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to talk about paid family leave. I'm going to talk about our subsidized child care and development system. And then I'm also going to talk about kindergarten and transitional kindergarten here in California. So the governor's proposed budget expresses a commitment to expand California's paid family leave program to six months. For those of you that aren't familiar, California leads the nation in our, in our paid family leave, and caregivers can now take six weeks off to care for a family member. And if you're a birth mother, you can take an additional six weeks. And through our paid family leave program, you're, you're reimbursed at 60 to 70% of your income. And so the governor's proposing to expand that to six months, which would put us on par with other industrialized nations, which is great news. The governor in this, in the next fiscal year, the 1920 fiscal year is proposing to um, lift, to adjust the reserve so that when we do expand it in future years, that we actually can um, afford to pay for it. And the governor also proposes to convene a task force to study and think about how we can thoughtfully expand our paid leave program, especially um, for low income caregivers who may not currently be able to afford to take time off at 60 or 70% of their low earnings. So at this point, I'm gonna talk to about subsidized childcare and our subsidized childcare and development system. So as some of you may know, that includes childcare and our state preschool program. So the 1920 budget proposal includes a one-time 737 million general fund investment in child care infrastructure. So infrastructure here refers to child care facilities and workforce development within the child care field. About two thirds or half a billion dollars of that is for facilities and then one third for workforce development. So the state already operates a number of child care facilities funding programs. So it isn't clear how this proposed funding would interact with those programs or make them more efficient or um, more user-friendly for providers throughout the state. 
I do want to note that we know that there's tremendous unmet need for subsidized childcare in California. And this budget proposal, while investing $737 million in subsidized childcare, doesn't purposely add one more additional space in subsidized childcare programs for families that are struggling right now to afford the high cost of care. In terms of our state preschool program, the administration has signaled the intent to move to universal preschool in California. So the governor proposes a couple of initial steps to move in this direction in the upcoming fiscal year. So first, the January proposal adds 10,000 full day, full year state preschool slots. That's with 125 million general fund to be used um, by non LEAs in the community. The proposal also shifts 300 million in existing funds for the state preschool program out of Prop 98 and into the general fund, again, for state preschool programs to be provided by non LEAs or non local education agencies. So this is going to free up more funding for nonprofit providers to offer state preschool programs and also um, hopefully to simplify funding for these providers too. So second the proposal loosens eligibility requirements for low and moderate income parents with four year olds. So currently to um, be eligible for full day, full year services, parents generally must be income eligible and then also show that they're working or going to school. So they have a need for care. So the budget proposal would eliminate the work school requirements in order to make access easier for the, to the program. And that's specifically for parents with four-year-olds. So in addition to the state preschool program, the state also provides early learning opportunities for some four, five, and six-year-olds in public school through transitional kindergarten and kindergarten programs. So the proposed budget focuses on expanding access to full-day kindergarten by using 750 million in one-time general fund dollars to build new facilities or renovate existing facilities and, and public schools. So we know from a survey administered by the California Department of Education that one of the main barriers for public schools or school districts in offering more full day kindergarten classes is a lack of facilities. They just don't have room for the classes. So hopefully this will address the um, shortage of facilities. Part day programs can be really hard to manage for low income working parents who might find it really difficult to find affordable care for their kids for the rest of the day while they're at work. Full day kindergarten could also potentially offer more um, learning opportunities for kids in the state too, which is always good news. So at this point, I'm gonna pause and see if anyone has any quick technical questions. And if not, we'll um, transition to Jonathan Kaplan, senior policy analyst to talk about more education issues. We're gonna go ahead and hold these for the Q&A section so we can go ahead and move on. Oh, thanks, Kristen. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, K-12 education and higher education and the governor's proposals for both, both of those areas. Um, the governor's proposal for K-12 schools and community colleges uh, fund, funding reflects the estimates that Kayla referred to earlier of general fund revenues and the, the governor's estimates that those general fund revenues increased both in 2018-19 and 2019-20 mean that the state is, uh, the, the, the governor's estimates are that, that uh, the state will be providing additional funding uh, for K-14 education in the current year and budget year. Specifically based on those estimates, the governor's budget proposal assumes that Proposition 98 uh, funding, that's the minimum funding level guaranteed in the state constitution for annual funding for K-12 schools and community colleges, uh, will reach more than $80 billion in 2019-20. That's the budget year. That's more than $2 billion more than the 2018-19 funding level that was estimated about six months ago uh, in the budget agreement of six months ago. Um, so, the, however, this is true for all budget proposals. Uh, estimates of the K-14 education minimum funding guarantee are almost certainly going to change between now and the end of this uh, budget cycle when the budget bills are signed uh, later this year. And that's because some of the inputs that some of the, the factors that are used in the calculation of Proposition 98 aren't finalized until the end of each fiscal year. So on a related note, uh, the governor's budget also proposes to change the way that the state currently reconciles differences between the way between the Prop 98 funding level provided as part of the annual budget 
um, and revisions to that funding level that happen at the end of each fiscal year. Now, the governor proposes to use the funding that he estimates will be available in Proposition 98 for, in a few ways. First, as relates to K-12 education, the largest share of funding, $2 billion, will be used to increase the state's local control funding formula. That's the main funding formula for K-12 schools. And this signals a continuation of support for Governor Brown's signature change in the way that the state provides funding for K-12 education. Um, and Governor Newsom's budget also provides $575 million for special education, roughly a third of that money coming in the form of one-time dollars. Governor Newsom's budget, uh, proposed budget also signals his support for two, uh, for two of Governor Brown's recently approved changes to the way the state funds California's community colleges. First, the budget provides a significant increase, $40 million, to allow community colleges to extend tuition-free tuition -free, uh, college for first-time, first full-year first students. That's an extension of last year's, uh, proposal, last year's um, uh, proposal to provide a first year of that, um, that tuition-free college now to a second year. Um, second, the budget maintains uh, the current funding rates for the state's new funding formula or allocation for general purpose apportionments for California community colleges, while also proposing a 10% cap on year-to-year -year increases for specific community colleges. The governor's proposed funding for K-12 schools and community colleges also includes a significant increase $3 billion in non-Proposition 98 funding as a payment to the state's teacher retirement system. That's the CalSTR system. This one-time funding would reduce K-12 school and community college districts required payments to CalSTR, which would free up dollars for other spending priorities or for school districts and community college districts to further pay down their retirement obligations. Now, turning to the rest of California's higher education system, the governor proposes significant ongoing increases for the University of California and the California State University, but links these proposed increases to an expectation that both of those segments will not increase tuition in 2019-20. The governor's proposal to increase ongoing funding by $300 million for the California State University and $240 million for the, for the University of California translates into roughly a 7% boost for each of those segments and includes specific items for which the increases are intended to support. Uh, the majority of those increases are uh, proposed for enrollment growth and operational costs. However, the budget also earmarks funding to support students who are experiencing um, we're experiencing food insecurity and homelessness, and there also is a specific proposal for the California State University for un to, to support undocumented students. Finally, the governor's proposed budget provides $130 million in funding to increase the state's student aid programs for higher education. Roughly $120 million of that amount would be dedicated for students uh, with dependent children. So without, uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Scott Graves, uh, our research director, who's going to speak with us about health and other issues. Hi, thank you, Jonathan. So hello to everybody on the webinar. I am going to be discussing some health policy issues in the governor's proposed budget. First, I wanted to remind everyone that if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can pose that question in the tweet uh, in the chat box, or you can tweet to um, hashtag policy perspectives. So uh, Governor Newsom's proposed budget recognizes that, Cal that while California has made substantial progress in expanding affordable health care coverage, um, to many Californians, we're still a ways away from achieving universal coverage in our state and also creating a healthcare system in which that coverage is truly affordable to all Californians. Um, in order to attempt to uh, move in this direction, uh, Governor Newsom has a few proposals um, in his budget that would uh, represent incremental but still significant progress toward achieving these goals. So, uh, for example, uh, the governor proposes 
to expand um, eligibility for comprehensive Medi-Cal coverage um, to undocumented immigrant young adults ages 19 through 25, um, so long as they are otherwise eligible for the program. In other words, they meet income and other eligibility requirements. Um, this is a key proposal because estimates show that more than half of the remaining uninsured in California are undocumented immigrants. So this would um, effectively um, bring the security of healthcare um, to a, a slice um, of those uh, remaining um, undocumented adults who are still um, uninsured in our state. Um, and this proposal also would build on um, the state's advance that we made back in 2016 in expanding um, Medi-Cal coverage to income eligible children and youth through age 18. So this would essentially be taking the state's existing policy and expanding it a little bit up the age scale um, to encompass um, all undocumented um, Californians um, through the age of 25 um, at the Senate Budget Committee hearing today. Um, a Department of Finance representative suggested that once you take um, various um, components of this proposal and the financing into account, um, during the first year, there would be around a net general fund cost of $133 million, um, and it's expected to reach around um, 138,000 um, young undocumented adults um, in the first year, extending what's called full scope or comprehensive um, Medi-Cal coverage to them. A second key component in the governor's proposal um, relates to a, a creating new state-funded subsidies for Californians who purchase their health care on the individual market. In other words, they don't get their health coverage through an employer and they're not eligible for Medi-Cal. So essentially they're buying on the individual market. There are a couple million Californians who purchase their health coverage this way. Um, some of them qualify for subsidies through the Affordable Care Act. These are federal subsidies, um, up to 400% of the poverty line. That's around 50,000 a year for an individual right now. Um, Californians who are beyond 400% of the poverty line do not qualify for any federal subsidies. So the governor's proposal is to say, let's take that group that's above 250% of the poverty line, all the way up to 600% of the poverty line, which is around $75,000 a year for an individual, and provide some state subsidies in order to make um, insurance purchased on the individual market more affordable um, for these Californians. Um, by doing so, um, we would help to um, ensure that we keep more Californians in the healthcare market, which would help to improve the risk pool, as it's called, um, and bring down costs across the board in terms of premiums um, for all Californians. Um, the governor has not yet said how these state subsidies would be structured. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. And in fact, um, Covered California, our state's healthcare exchange, has been working with a group of stakeholders who will be releasing a report in February that will provide um, some more context for this issue and talk about some paths forward in terms of improving affordability um, in the health insurance um, individual market. Um, the governor's uh, proposals in this area are could be released um, on or before February 1st as part of the trailer bill language that the governor is required um, by law um, to provide to the legislature and to the public. So we're likely to see more details on that um, in the coming weeks. It's also important to keep in mind that the governor's proposal to create new subsidies um, in the individual market is paired up with a proposal to create um, a state uh, requirement for all Californians to purchase health insurance or pay a penalty. Um, this would be modeled on the federal um, so-called individual mandate that actually went away on January 1st of this year. Congress and President Trump repealed it back in 2017, effective January 1st of uh, 2019. So there's no longer a federal requirement to purchase health insurance. Um, the idea here would be to create a state um, level uh, requirement attached to a penalty in order to encourage more Californians to sign up for coverage or keep the coverage that they already have. Um, the pairing up here with the subsidies idea, uh, according to the governor's um, budget summary, is that the penalty revenues that would be raised from this proposal, so some Californians 
would just may not purchase coverage, even if there's a requirement, they would pay a penalty at tax time, and those revenues would be used to help offset the cost of the new subsidies provided to Californians with incomes above 250% of the poverty line up to 600%. Um, that I'm sure is gonna be um, dealt, uh, uh, the legislature is gonna be diving into that issue very closely because one of the potential problems with it is that if the, end of, if the requirement is actually working, um, then more Californians will sign up for coverage, which is a good thing, and fewer Californians will be paying the penalty, which means this is essentially a declining revenue source. And one of the things you typically don't wanna do when budgeting um, is to um, create a new program and attach it to a declining revenue source. So that's one of the things that the legislature, I'm sure, will definitely be looking at as they dive into the governor's proposals. Um, one more big piece of the healthcare cost issue here, the governor issued an executive order last week and also as part of his budget has said he wants to increase the state's bargaining leverage with uh, prescription drug companies in order to help bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Um, that's a proposal that's probably um, a couple of years um, in the making, so that may not bear fruit um, until 2021 potentially, but at least um, the wheels are in motion and the goal here is not just to increase the state's bargaining leverage, but potentially bring the private sector in as well. So those are sort of the big picture issues in terms of healthcare coverage and costs. Um, I also just wanted to note a couple of quick things um, related to mental health and Proposition 56 tobacco tax funding. Um, in terms of mental health, the governor is proposing some um, additional investments in the mental health arena. Uh, the total of around $175 million in the coming year. Um, a big portion of this funding would go to local governments to help support um, supportive housing for people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness um, and uh, who are struggling with mental illness. Um, another component of this proposal um, would beef up the state's um, workforce development system for mental health practitioners to recognize the fact that we have a growing need um, for mental health um, experts, practitioners in California. So this would be um, an effort um, to get ahead of the curve there. And then in terms of Proposition 56, some of you may recall, um, this was uh, an initiative that was the voters approved a couple of years ago that put a new $2 per pack of cigarettes tax. It's a new state tax on tobacco um, that raises um, well over a billion dollars per year with most of those dollars going uh, to the Medi-Cal program. Um, as in prior years, most of these dollars in the governor's proposed budget would go to um, provider rate increases for doctors, dentists, um, and other providers in the Medi-Cal program. But the governor also includes some new proposals for Prop 56 dollars in his proposed budget. Um, for example, he wants to use around a total of $100 million to support family planning services in Medi-Cal, um, as well as um, trauma screenings for both children and adults in the Medi-Cal program, and also um, early developmental screenings um, for children, again, those enrolled in Medi-Cal. So um, I will stop there and pause to see if there are any clarifying questions. We're gonna go ahead and hold them for Q and A. So go ahead. Okay. So I will. Then, thank you. I will then go ahead and turn it in, over to Chris Haney, our executive director. Chris. Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for being with us here today. So I'm going to cover various other proposals that are in the governor's budget. Uh, I'm going to start in the criminal justice arena with a with the corrections and juvenile justice services. Uh, so. Uh, in the corrections arena where we have 127,000 adults in California who are serving sentences for felonies, uh, the spending level remains the same as it did in uh, the prior year, so at about $12.5 billion. Uh, but the governor does have a proposal where he anticipates ending the use of out-of-state facilities uh, to house uh, overcrowding. Um, uh, and we have about 2,000 people in the state who are currently housed in facilities in Arizona. He proposes to end the use of out-of-state facilities by uh, June of 2019. The plan had been for that to happen in January, so this gives the state a little more time uh, uh, over the next few months to, to move folks back into California facilities. Uh, in the juvenile justice arena, there's a significant proposal to move uh, the, the, uh, student, the, the youth that are housed 
in state facilities um, from the Department of Corrections over to the Department of Health and Human Services. We have about 760 youth who are currently in the juvenile justice facilities and the intention of the proposal is to ensure that the youth who uh, have been involved uh, um, with the system in some way that they're receiving some services through the Department of Health and Human Services that would help them be more successful uh, when, they're, when they're released. Uh, and there'll be more details to follow on what that means in the coming months. Uh, there are also significant proposals in the governor's budget around immigration. Uh, the governor notes that there is an expanding humanitarian crisis uh, on the state's southern border, and he proposes a rapid response fund uh, and $25 million that would be spent over the next several years to help community-based organizations and nonprofits uh, who are providing services uh, and, uh, around the border and with some of the uh, crisis issues that are happening there. Of that $25 million, $5 million would be spent in the fiscal year 2019-20. Uh, and the rest of it would be spent over the next three years. Uh, the governor's proposal also continues uh, annual dollars for legal services for immigrants that were in uh, the Brown administration budgets, including support for legal services uh, on University of California system campuses. Uh, and just to reiterate a note that was in Scott's presentation, also reflected in the governor's immigration proposals is the expansion to uh, uh, provide Medi-Cal for um, uh, undocumented adults who are under the age of 26. A um, couple of other quick proposals to note, the governor increases uh, in his proposal funding for the census in order to ensure high participation and more accurate counts so that the uh, federal programs and the dollars that flow to California based on uh, the number of eligible people for various programs that the count is reflected and the dollars that come in are accurate and also to ensure that our congressional representation is accurate and the governor proposes an additional $50 million to support the census count efforts. That brings the total uh, that would be allotted to uh, census to $140 million. And lastly, we just wanted to touch on disaster preparedness proposals because the state's been through a couple of very traumatic years in terms of disasters, particularly because of uh, wildfires. Uh, the governor has several new proposals in this arena, $172 million in additional funding for the Office of Emergency Services to help with things like the 911 system, uh, warning systems, um, state and local governments, and various public education efforts. There's $450 million for forestry and fire protection efforts that includes forest management, uh, upgrading of fleets of various sorts, and technology improvements. Uh, $31 million in aid for local governments who've seen property tax revenue losses due to property losses from disasters. And uh, the governor's proposal also dictates that one of the state's reserves funds, uh, reserve funds called the Special Fund for Economic Uncertainty be used if needed to help cover the costs of disasters in 2019-20 that might occur. So uh, that's the, the rest uh, uh, or the sort of other priorities we wanted to highlight in the budget. Uh, we'll stop there and move to Q&A from all of you. Uh, as has been noted previously, you can do that in a couple of ways by uh, putting a note or a question in the chat box or by tweeting at uh, hashtag policy perspectives. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we have quite a few questions coming in and I'm gonna try to group them by area as much as possible. Um, so bear with me a moment. Um, the first one I believe is to Scott. Will the state, tax subsidies for individuals who, who purchase health insurance from individual marketplace combined with any federal subsidies they may receive as well? Yes, that's a great question. And I actually meant to make that clear during my presentation, and I guess I didn't. So thank you for asking it. Um, people who have incomes up to 400% of the poverty line are eligible for federal subsidies. Um, that would be subsidies uh, that help bring down the cost of monthly premiums. Uh, for everyone in that group, as well as for people who have incomes up to 250% of the poverty line, they qualify for what are called cost sharing reductions, and that helps reduce the cost of uh, things like co-pays or deductibles, basically the costs you pay when you actually use um, health care services. So while federal subsidies are relatively generous for uh, the group below 200% of the poverty line, uh, those subsidies get less and less generous as you move closer to 400% of the poverty line. So under the governor's proposal, Californians, of course, if they qualify for federal subsidies, 
would continue to receive those subsidies, um, they would receive the new state subsidies on top of those federal um, subsidies that they receive. Um, one thing I should note here is, that, and maybe you picked up on this, is, is that the governor's proposal does not address this group between 200 and 250 percent of the poverty line. Um, these are folks with relatively low incomes um, who still don't qualify for a great level of assistance um, through the Affordable Care Act from the federal government. So it seems like it would be important in any proposal that's going to um, attempt to make individual market coverage more affordable to reach down at least to 200% um, of the poverty line in order to ensure um, that everybody who needs the help um, is getting that help. And then of course, those who have incomes above 400% of the poverty line who currently do not qualify for any federal subsidies at all, um, if the state went forward with a new program, uh, those, those state subsidies, of course, would be new subsidies for those individuals in that income range. Scott, while I have you on here, we also had another question that came in. Is there any increased fund allocated to senior programs for the 2019-2020 budget? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I was, you know, I've been fixated on what's not in um, the budget proposal for um, seniors and even people with disabilities. I bet there are things and, and people are gonna let us know about that. Um, if my colleagues also can think of something obvious that I'm missing, um, please let me, let me know. Um, of course, uh, you know, no governor is going to highlight things that um, aren't, that they're not proposing to do. But what we, what we highlighted in our analysis was that um, Governor Newsom's budget plan includes no cost of living adjustment from the state um, for SSI, SSP cash assistance, which is a very important source of basic income for uh, low income seniors and people with disabilities in California. That's more than 1 million people who rely on these monthly grants that are funded with both state and federal dollars. Um, over the last several years, the state has provided only one cost of living adjustment um, so that's an area where there's clearly a gap um, in the governor's proposal, at least from our perspective. Um, and a second issue that comes up in the healthcare arena that the governor's plan does not address um, and that we wrote about last year. Um, it's a relatively complicated issue, but in the Medi-Cal program, uh, when someone uh, who has a low income turns age 65 um, and, and um, in Medi-Cal, they all of a sudden get hit with a monthly deductible that can range up to several hundred dollars, which is, of course for a low income person um, is impossible to pay. Um, so there have been proposals um, in the legislature um, to fix that. I think we coined the term senior penalty. So whenever you hear people talking about the senior penalty in Medi-Cal, um, this is what they're talking about. Um, it's an effort to ensure um, that there's parity for how we assess eligibility um, for Medi-Cal and the costs that are paid um, for those who are over age 65 as, and under age 65. So that's an example um, of another area um, where the governor's budget is silent. And I'm imagining that the legislature will be interested um, potentially um, in pursuing that one as well. Um, if any of my colleagues have thought about positive things uh, that, the, that the proposal includes re uh, related to senior assistance, please pop on. Um, Otherwise, I will um, turn it over to others. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are reaching 2 p.m., and even though this is only slide two, we are going to continue and go through more the questions. So hang on with us if you would like. Um, the next question we have um, is to Jonathan. Can you explain or speak more to the increased local control funding formula for K-12? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned in the presentation, the state is providing in the budget proposal a $2 billion increase for the local control funding formula. That would bring total funding to about $63 billion. Uh, and the local control funding formula is the main funding formula for K-12 schools. It, it is allocated to school districts based on the number of students at, at individual grade levels. Uh, that's the base grant. And then uh, from there, it is uh, there's a supplemental grant of 20% on top of that base grant for uh, students who are either English learners, uh, students who come from low-income families or foster youth. And then if a school district has more than 55% of that population, then they get an additional 50% uh, concentration grant. So the $2 billion would be allocated to school districts across the state based on that formula. 
um, and it gives uh, that then up to, it's up to the school district to decide how those dollars are spent. Uh, and there is a process uh, that is called the local control accountability plan process that school districts are engaged with local uh, local uh, stakeholders in terms of making those decisions. There's one additional funding uh, piece here that the state is going, uh, the, the governor's proposed budget uh, provides $20 million for county offices of education uh, to uh, basically provide technical assistance and support to school districts that are struggling to meet accountability standards that are also a part of uh, the local control funding formula regulations. So um, I hope that answered the question, but um, whoever answered it, if you have more questions for me after the presentation, feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I have a couple of questions in uh, Kristen, your area of work. Um, the first one is, are grandparents taking care of children and slash grandchildren eligible for grants for children and families? So I'm not quite sure. Are you talking about child care grants? It's hard to determine the answer to that one. Um, if we're talking about paid family leave, the, um, the expanding paid family leave um, will be expanded with this task force. And so if you have thoughts or concerns about how paid family leave in California might be expanded, um, I would recommend getting engaged with this new task force to offer your thoughts and opinions on how the program can be enhanced in future years. So I'm not sure that that answers that particular question. Sorry about that. No, oh, thank you. Um, another question is, is there any discussion if the paid family leave will include families that experience stillbirth slash full term child death? And again, I think that that's going to be something that the task force takes on in 1920. Um, the budget, the proposed budget summary didn't include any details on how it would be expanded. They provided a couple examples of how it could be expanded, but the job of that task force, I believe, will be to um, think about how to strategically expand California's paid family leave to increase access for more caregivers in our state. Following up on that one, um, is the paid family leave proposal also provide additional paid time off for family caregivers or only for new parents? Again, we're gonna have to wait and see. Right. Um, is there a, is the funding for kindergarten only going to go for facilities or are there other plans for this money? That's a great question. And so the proposed budget summary does note that the funds can be used for other quote for other activities that reduce barriers to providing full day kindergarten. Now, those other activities, that was not defined in the proposed budget summary. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is watch for trailer bill language that's released in coming weeks and months to figure out how the administration is um, going to define other activities. Not sure um, which part of this question is referring to, but it says, is there any program enhancements for childcare for children who are below school age of zero to three since other low-income parents under UPK's age group also have similar needs? So the proposed budget summary does not include any changes to eligibility for subsidized childcare programs in California. So that's not to say that um, that's not something that might be addressed in coming months because the um, budget is in negotiation. And I'm going to use that as a plug that our next event for the speaker series will be addressing some of these um, subsidized child care needs. So stay tuned. Um, I have a question here that I think, Jonathan, you might be directed to you. Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Will the $350 million pay to pay down CalSTRS unfunded liability go towards paying down the state's unfunded portion or towards school districts unfunded liability? Yeah, so the proposal is to use um, $700 million to pay down school districts and community college districts unfunded liability in 2019-20 and in 2020-21. That would be $350 million for each of those two years. So it's to pay down the employers, that's the school districts and community college districts, uh, required contributions uh, in those two fiscal years. In addition, there's a $2.3 billion payment that's also for paying down employers' uh, contributions to the CalSTRS defined benefit program that would reduce out-year 
uh, obligations for uh, school districts and community college districts. Thanks, and I'm not sure if uh, this will be to Jonathan or Kristen, but what about paying teachers in K-12, specifically kindergarten teachers? Is there any allocation specifically for that? Maybe that's a little vague of a question. Oops, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, I'll try to field it. There is nothing, as I understand, in the budget proposals that are specific uh, to teacher salaries. However, um, the you know the large share of the funding that goes through the local control funding formula uh, does go to teachers, uh, teacher salaries and benefits for all uh, K-12 staff. Um, so um, don't know if that answers the question specifically, um, and don't I don't believe there is uh, there are dollars that are allocated specific to teacher salaries, which relates to the as relates to TK per se. If that was the question that was being asked, and if all the people that are asking questions, which is great, if you need to follow up with us, please feel free to reach out. Um, here is our contact information. I'm going to put it on the slide. Um, we have one more question and then we're gonna go ahead and end the webinar, but feel free again to reach out to us. This one is going to Sarah, I th believe. <laughs> is there any funding allocated or mentioned to addressing family homelessness, particularly for young children? Thanks. Um, you know, something that's sort of striking about the proposal uh, related to homelessness in this, um, in this budget is that it really focuses really strongly on unsheltered homeless um, individuals. It doesn't explicitly say it's focused on chronic uh, single, chronically homeless single adults, but that really seems to be kind of the, the core uh, population that is really in terms of the programs that are proposed and the funding that's proposed. Um, so there's definitely, there's no specific mention of any programs that would directly serve um, homeless families with children or homeless children. Um, I guess the one thing I will say though is that um, for a lot of homeless families with children, uh, the key issue really is housing affordability. Um, and so that's where you can look to some of the proposals related to increasing the production of housing um, and low income housing in particular um, that would that could ultimately help meet the needs of families that are really struggling to afford housing costs. But that said, um, there's nothing really specific in the budget that specifically focuses on the, the urgent needs right now of families with children who are homeless. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. This is Chris again. So there was going to be our last question for the day. As Janice has noted, uh, please feel free to follow up with questions to us. You, we've got an uh, email address there on the screen, and uh, you can find all of us on our website as well. Uh, so you can email analysts individually as you uh, have questions. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this public uh, for this policy perspective speaker series event. And I want to thank our sponsors, First Five Los Angeles and the Stupski Foundation once again. The next event in the series will actually be Monday, January 28th. If you're on our list, you'll be receiving new, uh, more information about signing for that, signing up for that soon. The topic will be child care uh, and the budget proposals. And the budget centers, Kristen Schumacher and Essie Hutchful, along with First Five California's Camille Maven, uh, we'll chat about the budget proposals and take your questions as well. Uh, I also hope that you'll sign up to attend our annual policy conference. Policy Insights 2019 will be held on March 27th in Sacramento. Uh, the link is in the chat. You can also find more on our website. And if you're on our list, we'll be letting you know uh, how to register for the conference as well. And we hope to see you here in Sacramento in just a couple of months. So thanks everyone for joining once again. Feel free to ask us questions and uh, otherwise have a great rest of your day.